punks from the suburbs Let the sky with too much reverb Getting the band back together Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Producers Perspective Live. It is Tuesday. How is everyone? Greetings to everyone watching live, and also hello to all of you who are watching the replay. We know a ton of you are tuning in after the fact, the Producers Perspective Live on repeat. Thanks for doing that. Thanks for being here. Uh, we love you just as much as if you showed up live. Well, not actually not as much, to be honest, because I feel like you might be able to make a commitment just to get here live with everybody else. but. You know, we like you just the same. Thanks for being here. If you missed last night, we had a great guest last night. Um, Santino Fontana talked about blowout poops. Uh, his mom was there. I mean, it was fantastic. So uh, go watch that replay, speaking of, uh, and you can hear all about it, including uh, what he's working, all sorts of stuff. And tonight, I listen, I feel like this is like my man crush guest week because I have another big Broadway leading man on tonight. Super talented, super great guy. James Snyder is here. Uh, Harry Potter, go Mary, come on, jeez, bro. If Then, Cry Baby, a whole bunch of shows. Sorry for the delay, but the delay is known as Mary. Eh, she's just a little slow. So anyways, uh, he's done a ton of Broadway shows. And also, if, you, if you're if you a fan of his on Broadway and, and you're like, wow, he's done so many shows, he's done like 10 times as many television shows as well, if not more. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, if you like James Snyder, give him an old thumbs up and a heart and all those things, because the more you do that, the more people that tune in on replay as well, because Mark Zuckerberg has some crazy algorithm. And the more people that tune in that, oh, Drew, look, Mary tried to make it up for me by throwing the compliment up. See, Mary controls these comments. So she was like, oh, damn it, I'm so slow on those pictures. I better put up something that makes Ken look good. Uh, thanks for that, Drew. That, that means an awful lot. And thank you for Mary. I do appreciate you. Uh, so anyway, uh, back to Mark Zuckerberg and his algorithm. Do throw lots of likes and hearts our way because it just spreads the word about everything we're doing and about our guests. Oh, look at that. I can see you doing it right now. I appreciate that. More people that watch, the more people that to, uh, will donate to the Actors Fund. And get this. So we, we have raised like 6500 bucks from you folks. And that's like, so I wanted to say a big thank you to all the people that have done this. 60 of you have done this. 60 people, there are your names, all you folks who have contributed uh, and raised some cash for the Actors Fund, a total of 6,500. So, you know, I'm a numbers guy, I'm a producer. I like live in spreadsheets, so I couldn't help but do some math. So follow me now. We've raised $6,500 from 60 of you. It means our average donation is about $108. Here's the interesting thing. We've gotten almost like 100,000 views of this summer. Right, a hundred thousand people have tuned in, which means ninety nine thousand nine hundred and forty of you have not yet donated. And at a hundred and eight dollars, that would be a total of ten million eight hundred twenty six thousand dollars we raised for the Actors Fund. If you hit our average donation, so we'd raise ten million dollars if the rest of you ninety nine thousand would do this. I don't, you know what? I don't want to be greedy. We don't even want five million dollars. We'll take a million bucks which means all of you only have to donate 10 bucks, 10 bucks. That's it. So if you can tonight, donate 10 bucks and we'll raise a million dollars. Wouldn't that be amazing? Uh, seriously, do donate if you can. Uh, we're going to keep doing this. Uh, we're getting, we're at 6,500. When I get to 10,000 bucks, I'm going to show everyone my Corona cut. Believe me, it is worth it. Reminder, if you missed the episode where I revealed my wife cut my hair with a Phillips body groomer. Mm, it's interesting. Anyway, uh, don't forget uh, to stay safe, stay healthy, stay home. We had some interesting news today from the Senate and Dr. Fauci and all that stuff saying maybe we don't want to rush out there into the streets. So do stay safe. Continue doing your social distancing. Uh, we had some other somewhat disappointing news. Oh boy, I'm really, I'm just serving it up for James to come on. Just like throwing all these disappointing things out there. Broadway announced that it would be out through the summer. But let's face it, that we knew that. We knew it. We we're gonna, it's announced closed through September. It's gonna be beyond that actually. We know that too. Um, but this is the date that you can exchange your ticket. So we knew that, so it's not that bad, right? We knew that was gonna happen. Uh, but we will be back and we will be back better than ever. And one of those actors that will be back performing in that big smash hit of that 
book slash movie series franchise that you've never heard of called Harry Potter will be this man, James Snyder. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, I don't think it was that bad of an intro. I mean, some bad news, but nothing that we didn't already know, I guess. You know. No, no. I mean, we, we knew it was going to happen, so it's kind of like out of the way now. It's like, okay, now we can – we know we're not going to have shows this summer, so it'll it'll be okay. How are you? You good? You healthy? I'm All great. Right? Uh, we're just – yeah, we're hunkered down. I live in New Jersey, so we're in our house. Like, uh, my wife does the majority of – the working now actually does pretty much all the working. And so uh, I, I watch the kids and, and, you know, I, I'm sort of fun dad, I think sometimes. And so it yeah. means like homework got done a little bit before dinner, you know, when really you should get the school work out of the way so we could then have fun. So, but um, you know, just figured it out. I'm trying to work on the yard when I can, I'm sick of cold wind mm. and Arctic with polar vortexes and whatnot. Um, so I'm just, I'm ready to get the nice weather here and get the backyard in shape. And um, yeah, I've just, I've been doing a lot of the the sort of charity type things. Uh, favorites for friends, a ton of cameos. Um, that seems to be a, a nice way to stay connected. And um, yeah, and I'm developing a course of my own actually right now too, so. Awesome. So tell me, um, I've been asking everybody, obviously you were doing the show when this was starting to come down, right? We were finishing tech rehearsal, a 10 week tech process to put year three in. And we were, we had two scenes left when the wrong, well, actually that morning when everyone got to work, this was on the 12th, on Thursday, the 12th, uh, we got to work at 10 AM. We did our warm up, and a, the, the rumblings were like, when's it coming? Um, uh, and everyone was just waiting to hear and waiting and finally we got after lunch and then they they called a, a cast meeting for everyone at rehearsal we sat in the house and they said look this is not we're not going anywhere it's just a pause you can think of it as a pause um and there were a bunch of kids that were about to make their broadway debut on Tuesday on uh, the year three cast there were 10 new cast members uh mm -hmm. some of them in their broadway debuts and i feel so bad for them and then also to get robbed of uh, my final show with the year two cast. Oh man. Bad but news. I heard weeks. So we did Wednesday, we did two shows Wednesday and then that was it. And I didn't, I didn't get some last hugs in or that last, you know, when it, it gets a little more precious, which I think is actually maybe poetic for the entire experience mm. with that cast. But, um, do you yeah, remember, so that was it. Do you yeah. remember the performance the night before where things were starting to get a little like something's going on out there. Did it, yeah. did it affect the show, the audience that night? What was going on? The audience on? was smaller. I mean, the audience was like, we're always sold out. Like for the most, no, we're always sold out. Um, and rarely an empty seat can be seen. And that front row, uh, you could see patches. It was like, Oh, this is, this is coming. People are not. Uh, and, and uh, we had, for the first time we had people, you know, the lovely people that hand out the flyers for stuff. And it was, we were dropping, they were dropping prices to 20 bucks a ticket, mm. you know? So, and that was on, I mean, we, I was walking into rehearsal on Tuesday uh, and it was, someone was like $20 tickets. I was like, to me, to my show, yeah. to my show, <laughs> you know, Harry Potter. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. Like this is real. Um, yeah, but at least it showed they were proactive and, and at least trying to problem solve where they could. Um, so we knew it was coming. We didn't know when I, I was hoping for the weekend. I was hoping to get through the weekend, mm -hmm. at least through Thursday, Friday. And, uh, you know, I think we all underestimated how quickly everything would hit, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Normally you can't get a drink at a Broadway theater for 20 bucks. It's, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. you, have, you have kids, plural. How many kids do you have? I have Oliver who's seven. And Willa, who's four, almost five, and she's quite the handful. Um, she's de definitely the one who, like, is probably going to be an actor, you know, for her sake, hopefully not. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, and they're great, and they, they play a lot, They play together really well um, most of the time. And so, what yeah, I just balance – I try and balance myself between playing, like, cars with Oliver and then being like, okay, hold on. 
and then I run over and I play dolls for 15 minutes. So I do a lot of like back and forth. It feels very, I don't know, like some sort of comedy of errors almost. My parents. It's, it's a sitcom. Uh, what are you telling them about this time? How are you explaining it to them? How are they dealing with it all? They understand there's the, I mean, they understand the term, there is a term called coronavirus. Um, and that it's like the flu and they, that we are staying in because, um, we don't want to get the flu because too many people have the flu. And if everybody has the flu at the same time, then they can't take care of everybody is basically, you know, what, what's been explained. My son is thrilled. If he never left the house ever again in his entire life, like he would be like, yes. So he's one of, he's an introvert who social distancing is like, <laughs> Like, oh, thank God. I mean, I don't have to talk to anybody. I don't have to be outside. I don't, and you know, he's a physical kid. I mean, he loves things like that, but he just, he's, he's, a, he's a homebody for sure. And an introvert. Yeah. So I, you know, I've been doing this thing lately with all my big celebrity guests like you and going onto their Wikipedia page and <laughs> digging in to try to find some of the most random things. So tell me, uh, I noticed that you once played Luke Skywalker in the Star Wars trilogy in 30 minutes. Is that true? Star Wars trilogy in 30 minutes. Um, it was. It came out of USC, actually. It was in an experimental theaters class. So it's, it's sort of like Stoppard's 15-minute Hamlet. Oh, which, just, I was just like it. And like, exactly. Like it. No, it's meant to – so we, we – I – came in later. So it was developed in an experimental theater class and they took it to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival with a, a USC alumni and student company. And um, John Blankenship, who's a scenic designer and then by trade before he went into academia, he, they, we, so I ended up doing it first in the, at the Fringe. We did 13 plays in rep and every night it was our midnight show. Um, and so, and in Scotland, 15% of the population on one of their senses said their religion was Jedi. So <laughs> the curtain would rise and the smell of alcohol would hit us <laughs> midnight. And they do this thing at the fringe where they stomp their feet when they love something. And so just the rumbles. Um, and it was all meant to, to feel like we just ran into the garage, grabbed some props and just are doing the show. So it would go, you know, episode four, uh, Rebel Spies, blah, 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 and everything's really fast. Come out of joke, tell us you plan, you those, till you found those plans and bring me the passengers. I want them alive. Darth Vader, only you could be so bold. Don't act so surprised. <laughs> you're going to be mercy mission this time. I don't know what, you're part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. Take her away. You're teeny, Luke, take these two over the garage, will you? It's that. So it, it's this lightning fast, cut down version of everything. And then with just goofy homages to, like when I fall off of Cloud City, I go, I get my hand chopped off. I just put it under my shirt sleeve and go run around the entire audience. And then later on, um, the stormtroopers are just guys with white bike helmets and like water guns. Like, it, and we ended up actually out of school. It was one of my first, I was still a senior at USC and we were doing it at the Cornette Theater, which is now Largo um, or the Cornette at Largo. Um, and uh, yeah, we had like a, a six, seven month run uh, after school and it was one of those things that was sort of oh. <laughs> there you go oh, no. <laughs> there you redeemed yourself as you can see so that i'm i'm in my x-wing which is a chair that i put over my head with lights on either end of it and 3po was a literal trash can and uh, uh with duct tape and the lightsabers had duct tape and then the darth vader and chewbacca are only in one scene the entire trilogy and so they do six and 60 now. I, I've been a little busy with other things. So I haven't kind of gone back to the, to the gang, although I love them dearly. Um, I've gotten to meet George Lucas twice. I met JJ Abrams. Oh, oh yeah. He, it's like, it was like, oh yeah. I, 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 we did it at the Presidio for the opening of uh, Lucasfilm's um, new studios and whatever at the Presidio in San Francisco. Like it's taken me all over the world. Indianapolis, yeah. like, different places this goofy little musical or not even musical sorry goofy little play that like yeah i mean it got me another job that got me a, a, a studio film so it's like that is what it's you're the guy from that star wars thing oh great and all of a sudden i was playing a french poodle dry humping Kristen bell's leg like there you go this is what i love about theater first of all 
some of the best things I've ever seen have been, I actually wrote something in a blog today, like theater makers are like the MacGyver of the arts. Like we just like, we're, we, work, we work best when we just make use of whatever's around us, yeah. um, which it sounds like that. And it's another great example of just putting yourself out there in something, no matter how small, it may lead to something huge, like a studio film where you're humping Kristen Bell's leg. Oh, well, I no, I was humping Kristen Bell's leg mm -hmm. at the, at the uh, Matrix Theater, at Joe Stern's Matrix Theater on Melrose. And that, uh -huh. and that director, Andy Fickman, went on to direct She's the Man. He also directed Heathers, which I did every single reading and workshop of before they needed actual young people. Um, but LA, it was interesting coming, because I did my coming up really for the most part in LA, which is a different experience than most of the people that I work with who all went to their school, came to New York. Well, I went to USC, I was working, doing Gilmore Girls and whatever, then I graduated, I stayed in LA and I did whatever I could. And I sort of found a niche in this little musical theater world that exists in LA, the 99C theater. Like I was doing little theater here and there and that led me to Rock of Ages, which brought me out here to do a workshop at New World Stages the week that John Waters happened to be in town auditioning mm -hmm. Crybaby, which landed me the lead in Crybaby. Like uh, I wasn't even an equity member because it, it didn't make sense. It didn't make sense to the union because it, I in LA, I'd make $8 a show. I made dollars a show. In, I, luckily, Star Wars was in a 200 seat theater, so $25 a show. I made $5 a show, so I, which I would promptly spend at the Cornette Pub down below, which is the Roger Room now. So, like, yeah. And was, not to bring up like sad, disappointing news, but you'd probably take that 25 bucks a show right now because there's no drink up. <laughs> <laughs> My water. <laughs> Uh, so what, listen, what, you're such a creative guy, obviously. And like, what, what are you doing? You said you were working on a course and what else are you doing to keep your creative juices flowing during this crazy time when you can't exercise those muscles on stage in a big Broadway house? Yeah. I've been playing more guitar a little bit. I've been playing piano sort of, but really like the dad stuff, I've been pretty worn out by the end of the day. Teachers don't, get, uh, my mom's a teacher, but like, I have such respect for, someone who can spend all day with kids. Um, it's uh, so I'm pretty wiped out by the end of that, but um, you know, you make do with what you have. And so I, I'm in my, I'm in my basement here. I just hung a bunch of pictures on the wall today. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm working with my hands a lot. That feels really good to build my kids a, a play set. And, you know, I'm just, I'm finding different projects around. And then um yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm using this opportunity as a time to hone in on how I do what I do. I, I, I've had such a mishmash of, I, I'd like, maybe I will call it, I've had a very, a varied career or I'm a very versatile actor. It, I just went wherever anyone would give me a job and I figured it out. <laughs> um, so I went from Luke Skywalker to go do, you know, that, to do this, to do, you know, uh, to anything I could. And so, um, it led to me working with a lot of very interesting people and borrowing what I could and not really, I, I, I did have a process, but I didn't know it. And I've never sat down and said, how do I actually do what I do? How do I create? What's important to me when I create? And so I'm using this time to sort of get, get clarity on that. And then I think in doing so, my wife was like, well, why don't you just think about maybe doing a, a like a, a, co a course, just a, a group coaching course. She does a lot of masterminds. My wife is a uh, entrepreneur coach. Like she helps people uh, with product-based businesses sell their products. And she has a, a really popular podcast. And she's on, you know, she, yeah. I mean, she's on fire. Give her, right. give her a, a shout out. What's the podcast? The Product Boss. Nice. Mary's Googling like crazy. I can see her in the background. She's yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, br it's brilliant. Um, and uh, her and her business partner. So my wife was in fashion. She's a fashion designer by trade and um, was, had to pivot her business because uh, in transit came along and I was like, babe, I'm not working in LA. We'd always used LA was home base. 
it, we went back after the tour of if then to settle down and live in a house and exist. And then I got an offer for a movie with Eden Espinosa actually. And, uh, shot that movie and while i was shooting that movie in indianapolis got a straight offer for in transit so it was like i i was like babe la is all well and good but i think i do what i do and provide for this family the best in new york um and so uh we moved to we like officially moved here and then she shut down her office in la in downtown la and pivoted from helping people start fashion lines to helping people start or drive their product-based business farther. Um, uh, she's a, she's a visionary, I would say in that way. She helps people figure out like from selling on Instagram to, to whatever, just getting that multi stream sales going. I mean, it's fascinating really. I mean, that's why I like, I love to watch what you do because you guys think so much alike, you and my wife, actually, I'm like, you guys are brilliant. Uh, my wife's dad was a movie producer. So it was like, I think she's got that part in her that says like, how do I make this work? How do I make it creative? And how do I make money off of it? That's the catch, that's the catch. Yeah. It's so funny you said that about the LA battle with you is because I remember after Crybaby, you like burst on the scene in a way and everyone was like, who is that guy? I mean, that guy's amazing. And then after that, I was like, where'd he go? Where'd he go? Where was that yeah. super talented guy that was just killing it? And then, cause you went to LA. So I, for one, I know was very pleased to see you come back to town. Uh, so I'm glad you used your persuasive powers on your wife. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't her. I, I was testing for pilots. Like I, the, I had an offer to do Rock of Ages off Broadway, um, but before Constantine, like they, it was my role. They were like, it's your role. We're taking it off Broadway. We think you do it. And I was testing for pilot that week. And I was like, I'm going to go back to LA and do some TV and make some real money. And I was heartbroken by Crybaby too. I was coming off. I didn't know that it, it wouldn't, I didn't know that shows didn't succeed. I didn't know that 85% of new musicals don't recoup. Like I had no idea any of that. So I took it all very personally. And so I tucked tail, really, at the end of the day. I, my voice was exhausted. I was exhausted. The amount of changes that were thrown at a 26-year-old me who'd never carried a show of that size. Like, I carried Rock of Ages, I guess, you know, but that was in L.A. for 700 people, you know. Uh, so, it, yeah, I didn't know any better. So I was exhausted. I was heartbroken. And I had a, what I thought was a TV career calling. And then uh, the writer's strike happened. And all of a sudden, I was at audition sitting next to Jerry O'Connell going like, the hell am I doing here? Like, what am I doing here? Why did they even bother calling? I'm not going to sell commercials for these people. Like, you know, and so all of a sudden, I, I lost a lot of confidence, a lot of steam. And uh yeah. And, and then my agents like, and then my agents dropped me. So then all of a sudden I was scrambling to like my way back, you know? And, yeah. So that's, that is amazing. So I never knew this. Like, there you are, Broadway star, 26 years old, go to LA television, like all this stuff. Yeah. Your agents drop you, which is like the, uh, what age was it? Tell me it was paradigm. like, some, no, it's paradigm. Shocking. Shot. They were great. You know, it was, it was, I, I screwed up a couple tests. I te tested opposite Matthew Broderick for this thing. And I blew, I blew it. I flat out blew it. Um, uh, what was the movie? Do you remember? No, it was a TV show. It was uh, in the 30 rock, like in 30 rock, like right on the floor below Saturday Night Live. Uh, it was called Beach Cities or something. It was like a, a small newspaper in the Hamptons. Yeah, it obviously didn't work. So. I went in, I, I did a Will Arnett impression. It was basically what I did. I did, because I was like, this was clearly written for Will Arnett. I was like, I know these writers. I know this studio, Will Arnett. So I went, I did, I did Will Arnett. That's what I did. And then they rewrote it the night before my test. And I couldn't make it funny. I couldn't make it funny. And so, so I, I panicked and I went and got like the goofiest outfit I could and then walked into the room. And... It just just went downhill. And so what what did something like that teach you that now you take into every audition that you 
go into that obviously you, you've, you've had a very successful career in television, obviously on Broadway as well. So what did you learn from that that you might impart to all the folks watching out there? Yeah, that you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything except the work and be present and be yourself. I thought I needed to dress up and change whatever I needed to do to fit some mold. Um, and uh, that, and if the job's not yours, like the job's not yours. So go in, own the room, show them what you, you've got, who you are, what you do and how you do it. And then leave and shut, shut, just shut your mouth, do your work. Like this, I have to tell myself that before every audition. Cause I I'll run, I'll run at the mouth. Uh, I'm a rather energetic human being. And so like, Oh yeah, I, I bombed my audition for waitress was just did not. I was like, I'm perfect for this. I'm literally, I did that role. And if then, like, I'm just bringing, if then like did, I did this role and you know, so, so I, I'm a bit of an open book uh, and sometimes then people are able to make their own judgments or whatever. And it's really at the end of the day, um, where I, I didn't think I was going to book Harry Potter. I honestly, I was like, I'm not going to book this in a million years. I'm going to do the work because I love this story. I love this character. I love this series. I love this universe. This wizarding world is cool. And I understood who Harry was for me and how I was a dad in that same way, trying to figure it out. And so I was like, I'm going to go in. I'm going to be a, a dad who's trying to help his son or connect with his son whose work situation kind of blows. Like, and, and I did the work and I made it about the work and, and I left it all on the table and they were like, wow, that was great. And I was like, it's one of those greats where you know, I showed them that I, I was a great actor and could do it. Uh, but I'm sure I'm not getting this job. And then here we are. So, you know, hmm. be yourself, I guess, is it. You're enough and be yourself. I love also the idea of just go in, even when you know it's not right for you, you own the room because you never know what's going to happen. Someone in that room could lead you to another job and you could wind up pumping Kristen Bell's leg again. I mean, it's like that kind of thing. It's like all you, know, you just never know who's in that room. I've hired so many people for other gigs as a result of auditions for something else entirely. So yeah, I, I, I love that. I love that too. You've obviously been able to flip a coin too, I would imagine, and you're not, you don't get as devastated as you did post cry baby. How do you stay positive in a business that is filled with rejection and not getting it more often, even for people like you who book all the time, you're still booking a fraction of what you were seeing for it. Oh, it was a year and a half between my life. Hold on. I'm, my computer's acting funny. Hold on. Thanks for us, at least. We get it's not plugged in. Hold on. Ah, so I don't lose you. Oh, okay. we go back to the Luke Skywalker photo. <laughs> yeah. All right. We're plugged in. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, it's I, I have a great um, a friend of mine slash like mental coach uh, Eric Bean is his name and I meet with him and really at the end of the day it's about connecting to the why the why the big why why do I do what I do why do I love what I do and so if I can stay clear on that uh, it, it makes it really simple and and the best part about like. I'd say my acting took a huge shift when I had my son because all of a sudden my why was bigger than me, bigger than my job. My why was right there, a little tiny thing that I had to take care of. And so um, that's, that's really it is, is just realizing like there's more to this than that next job. Like it's a long career and it's going to be up and it's going to be down. And I'm, I'm lucky. Like I tell my friends, it's like, I've done, I've hit the things. I've already done the things that 15 year old me would have never imagined. I would have gotten to do. Yeah. I've done it. Like, and so I can, I can die happy. I mean, like in a sense, um, I mean, I don't want to die anytime soon, but like it's, it's, and now, so, 
again, I just, I connect to the why I love it and, and reconnect to the work. And so, um, yeah, it, it's tough though. I mean, it sucks. I just, I meditate and I have a very supportive wife and, you know, but at this point I'm used to it. I've been acting professionally. I've been, since I was still in college even. So it was like, I guess I'm used to like when this COVID stuff happened, what are you going to do? I was like, I've been, I spent a year in a show. Like, do you know how long that is for most shows? Like I remember when we were doing it then and we hit the point where Jen Colella, which it was her ninth show. And she was like, guys, this is the longest I have ever been in a show. And it was her ninth Broadway show. I mean, come on. It's crazy. You know, then she gets in Come From Away and just breaks uh, breaks all the records. Well, speaking of your beginnings, uh, Taylor Penny asked, what was your very first job in the theater? And what did you take away from it that it stayed with you? P.S. You were so kind when I met you at In Transit. Look at that. Um, oh, first that's... job in the theater and what you took away from it. Uh, well, my first job in the theater was that, was that Star Wars gig. Oh, really? Uh, I mean, prof professionally, my, the first play I ever did was in high school. I did Godspell. Um, and you know, you like, Jesus? I was Jesus. Uh, it was freshman year. My freshman year, I went to Christian Brothers High School and they were like, can you do this? Because like one, like Christian, whatever his name was, like couldn't do it. Uh, so like the senior who was going to do it decided not to do it. And it sort of left like, I don't know. They just, so... Uh, I sort of never looked back from that, but um, were you a singer at that point, or were they just like, "Yeah, you, you look the part. You look like a Jesus. We'll just throw you in there." No, I think I, I've always had a really good voice, you know. Uh, uh, or I don't mean to put it like that, but you know, like I've always sung well, and um, and I think there's a certain innocence and energy that that they trusted I could bring to it. I, I don't know. I mean, I was in jazz choir at that point. So. And they're just like, well, he can sing it. <laughs> I don't know. And learning lines, it was the bane of my existence. And then here I'm in a, a show that's five hours long. Um, yeah. And so what's it, I mean, this, you talk about you loving the world. I mean, this thing has, I mean, is there a bigger franchise? You, you've done all the big franchises, apparently. You've done Star Wars <laughs> at the Fringe and you've done Harry Potter. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. This is and Jesus. So, like, who else is there for you to play? No wonder you can die out. You can play Harry Potter, Luke Skywalker. Um, I done. What What's it like to play a role like that? That so many people one know about, have read, love, and I'm sure quite a few are obsessed with. So, yeah. what What's that experience been like for you? Yeah, it was intimidating at first. Like, I, I didn't know what to expect, but like. I'm no stranger to fandom, you know, so knowing the being, I love to go to Comic-Con, like, the, you know, going to the Star Wars celebration. So it's like, I understand a fan mentality and how to honor that also. So, and that means know your stuff, like dig in. And I love doing research. Like, uh, so there's an endless supply of stuff on the internet. Plus there's seven unbelievably great books to pull from. So it was, it was really weird going back and reading the books. I'd read the first four in college or a little post-college and uh, going back and reading a book that much more in as the person, if that makes any sense. So mm -hmm. like reading the books being like, Oh, what's happening to Harry is happening to me. Wow, yeah. Oh, this is me looking back almost like memoirs of my life. And this poor kid, I mean, <laughs> trauma the trauma that these kids suffered was unbelievable um so uh, you know i'll say i didn't treat it lightly and luckily i we had the support of a director that that um really let us find it our, ourselves um and knew his stuff too i mean i could be like why why do i do this he's like well in book three X, Y, and Z happens, you know, and you see how this connects to that. And he pulled from that. Um, so luckily it was our associate Des Kennedy and he, uh, he was there for the entire process too. So talking about, we were the fifth cast he had set um, between the three London casts, 
Melbourne and uh, and the first Broadway cast and us, maybe we're the six, I don't know. But um, so he had done it so many times also that that there was a shorthand that allowed us to come in and we, and we still had 15 weeks, but come in and really dig deep really quickly. Um, so, yeah. Hmm. Have you, uh, Scarlett Dane asks, did you ever say no to a job offer and regret it later? Anything you turned down that you're like, yeah, that would have been a good one. Well, so, I mean, Rock of Ages off Broadway, like I kicked myself for a really long time. That being said, thank God I didn't. Um, I found an amazing voice teacher, Edward Sayeg, who's in Los Angeles. And I ended up in an Encore's version of Fanny right there. Um, oh, Fanny at Encore's. And I found my like legit singing voice. And I found an amazing acting coach in LA that I wouldn't have found. And I, my wife and I like got married, things like that, where it's like, I, for a very long time carried and took it very personally that, that um, I said no to rock of ages. And even to this day, like I, I write Carl Levin and be like, Hey, yeah. Remember that? Or, or Matt Weaver or somebody. And I'm like, ah, you know, that being said, I don't know if my voice would have been able to handle it. Constantine is like, he's a beast. Oh, he is. It's and I was like, that is not the drew that I would have done, yeah. you know? Or even Jeremy Jordan, I'm like, yeah, like that's a different voice. Those are two of the best voices, like, you know. Uh, so, so it's it, it it is one of those things where my Drew, the Drew that I created from the beginning with Laura Bell Bundy, actually, um, uh, she played the Cherry in our version. Like it was, it would have been a very different different thing, and and so uh, I wouldn't have learned the things that I'd learned. Um, and I wouldn't have the career that I've had probably because I don't think I would have had the, the legit sound that came out of my face. And that, that, that led me to do something like Carousel at Good Speed Opera House that then led to If Then, that then changed my entire life. Like, Yeah, it's, it's, everything happens for a reason. It's such a cliche, but it's the path that you were meant to take. And uh, it's, you know, it's If Then. Right. It's, it's, if then. It's, it's like it's 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 if then we, we just did a cast zoom, like not like a public thing, but just us hanging out because it was like, I miss everybody. I was like, zoom, done. We're doing it. Um, <laughs> you know, but we were all just talking about it was interesting. It's one of those shows where we were all grown up. It was a bunch of grown ups. There weren't a lot of young people. And we were all like Adina was going through a divorce and I had just had a kid, a kid and, you know, LaShawn's was dealing with her sort of coming back onto the scene and Jen and her divorce and Michael, you know, all of these, these personal things we were all going through and we all just came together to really support each other and support the work. It was, it was such a wonderful work environment. Although I've found that pretty much every Broadway show I've worked on has been pretty, either I've been really lucky or I think the majority of shows is are. I think if you're a jerk, you kind of get knocked out of this world pretty quickly. Well, I think it also has a lot to do with you. You're such a positive guy and you have so much great energy. And I think you bring that to the shows and you probably help create that environment. And I, for one, am so glad your If Then has brought you back to Broadway. Uh, and I very much appreciate you being here uh, today and just sharing a little bit of that light with us and inspiring all these folks out there. So thanks for doing it. Get back to the cars and the dolls and your very <laughs> yes. Hot Wheels and Barbies. I love it. I love it. Sounds like a blast. Thanks for being here, man. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Ken. Bye-bye. James Snyder, everybody. James freaking Snyder, another big Broadway star on The Producer's Perspective Live. I'm so thankful that he was here tonight. I'm also so thankful for, hold on, hold on, give me a second. Hold on. Damn it. Dang it. I would be so much better at this if I could. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? There. For Sam Ars, who made another donation to the Actors Fund. So thanks for that. Uh, once again, thanks to James for being here. Thanks to all of you for all your donations. Don't remember, don't, don't remember? God dang it, I thought I'd get through one episode without just making myself look like an idiot. Don't forget, now I blow the joke. Don't forget, if everyone donated 10 bucks, we'd raise a million dollars for the Actors Fund. It's just math, everybody. It's just math.
A um, couple things. Tomorrow night, Dominique Morosu, book writer, ain't too proud, incredible. She, talk about, she tells this great story. She's been on my podcast about how she started her career and just by doing everything and anything she could get her hand with a pen around, she just wrote, 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 wrote. And it's one of the reasons she's a big hit today. So she's going to have some very inspiring things to say. We'll hear what she's working on as well. Don't forget all of our episodes that we've done are on replay, right? You can check them out all on replay. Look at them now. It's like almost 50. We're up to almost 50. Uh, so who's going to be 50th? Do we have someone special for 50th? Mary? Who is it? Who is it? Chat it up. Chat up who's going to be our 50th. Uh, and as we wait for Mary, who's just there, see, she redeemed herself with Luke Skywalker. Now she's just a little slow again, just a little slow. Uh, we're going to take you home with another something to make you smile. So this person, this is, this is a woman from LA named Mary Neely. She is a screenwriter. She wrote this movie called Valley Girl, the movie, uh, and which is like a remake of an old eighties film. So, you know, I love it. She has done a series. She's quarantined alone in Los Angeles. So she's done full-on music videos from big musicals all by herself. And this is the opening to Beauty and the Beast. It is like she has thousands and thousands of views now. And some big, big stars have been watching, including, I don't know, Lin-Manuel Miranda has been shouting it out. So this is definitely worth checking out. It's super fun and it's super creative. Yes, those are all the costumes she found like in her closet for all the characters in the opening of Beauty and the Beast. Check it out at theproducersperspective.com backslash smile. It will make you smile, number one, and make you look in your closet tomorrow and be like, what, what musical could I do? So go ahead and check that out. And we will be here tomorrow night and we will continue to be here. Uh, and you will donate $10 to the Actors Fund and we will raise a million dollars. Okay? How about that message? Thanks for being here, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow night. Bye-bye. Getting the band back together Getting the boys